Welcome to Learn's Time Live series hosted by the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. My name is Ariana Robinson and I'm the Assistant Director of Business Operations at the Racy Anderson Center for Sustainable Business. On select Fridays at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, you'll have the chance to hear from Scheller faculty, student, and alumni speakers as they discuss relevant topics for the tech-driven digital age. At Scheller, we're proud to offer undergraduate MBA and PhD programs along with open enrollment and custom ed executive education programs. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tiffany Johnson, Assistant Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Scheller College of Business. She earned her PhD in Management and Organization at Pennsylvania State University and her Master of Human Resources and Industrial Relations degree from the School of Labor and Employment Relations at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Johnson's research focuses on the micro foundations of inequity. She is particularly interested in how individuals with organizations not only create but also dismantle experiences related to stigma and marginalization. She examines in her interests in the she examines her interests in the context of disability, race, gender, social class, and other differences that are increasingly important to consider in today's workplaces and organizations. Her dissertation was selected as a finalist for the INFORM's Best Dissertation Competition in 2015, and her research appears in journals such as Organization Science, Journal of Applied Psychology, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, and Organizational Psychology Review. Today, Tiffany will discuss the big picture of allyship in the workplace. She'll provide examples of behaviors and strategies that allies and advocates can use to mediate between workers with stigmatized and non-stigmatized identities to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations. As always, feel free to ask any questions in the comment section. Tiffany uh, will address as many as possible at the end of her presentation. And turning it over to you, Tiffany. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being here today. I am looking forward to sharing space with you and just talking about some um, hopefully kind of practical takeaways that have come from some recent research, uh, research that's been published by myself and some colleagues. Um, so uh, as Ariana, so thank you so much, Ariana, for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much to Scheller for having this space. Um, I, as uh, Ariana mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about allyship and advocacy in the workplace as an everyday practice. And I'm really grateful that you are here to like join in on the conversation. Um, I know our time together is a little, it's 30 minutes. It's perfect amount of time, I think, for this part of the day. Um, if you are, are already a student or um, a, yeah, a, a student at Scheller, please know that we're going to talk about things that I offer in the class, work equity and wellness in more depth. So if you're interested in exploring these topics more in that class, please do sign up for it. Um, I'm offering it in the spring of 2023. So before we get going into um, the topic at hand, I wanted to back up a little bit because I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about uh, why I study what what it, what it is that I that I that I study. Um, so this is a picture of my father and I. His name is Tracy. Um, if, if I could have, I would have put a picture of the whole family, but this is one of the this is the picture that came up first, so I just put it in the presentation. But I also think that he is a pretty significant role model in, the, in, the, in, in, in our entire family for the work that many of my family members engage in. So I'm from Freeport, Illinois. It's a pretty small, smallish town uh, on the northern, close to the northern border of uh, Illinois and um, was raised there. And my, my dad, my mom, and now my brother and sister, everybody was involved in some kind of work in the community, working with groups that were underserved, underserviced, or underrepresented in some kind of way. Be that because of mental health, disabilities, gender, race, social class, domestic violence, or addiction, right? So my family, uh, I kind of grew up in a household where these were topics that were kind of 
part of our everyday conversation, right? We talked about if we were going to talk about things that were happening at work for my parents, or if we're going to talk about things that are happening at work for my brother, sister, and my sister-in-law, we're talking about working with groups that are often kind of overlooked. Um, and so it's, if I were to explain the reason as to why I do what I do, it's kind of been the water that I, that I, that I swim in for all of my upbringing, right? And I continue to swim in it, you know, whenever I go home and talk to family and friends or we talk on the phone, this is, if we're talking about work, we're talking about their working with all these kinds of populations. Um, in particular, though, with my dad, uh, I remember specifically because, as I said, I grew up in a small town in Illinois, but my dad was the leader of the Martin Luther King Center in that town. And in that center was housed the Boys and Girls Club. So every year there would be a big MLK celebration. And Dr. King was uh, was one of the role models whose symbols were kind of all over our house. My, my dad looked up to him and still does. One of the speeches that my dad gave uh, at one of the community programs was uh, named after uh, Dr. King's speech, where do we go from here, chaos or community? And to this day, even though I was a, a young girl, I can remember my dad giving the speech because I, I often ask myself that question, where am I going with this decision? Am I moving towards chaos or am I moving towards community? And what does that even mean? I don't think I have all of the answers to those questions, but I feel like it's a great guiding post for some of the, the, the challenges that have come up um, throughout life when it comes to doing this work, actually doing this work on an everyday basis or trying to, right? Um, so one of the quotes from the book, because as I got older, I actually became interested in like, what, what was that speech that my dad was talking about? I wanted to read it and learn about it on my own. Uh, one of the quotes from, that, from the book uh, that really stood out to me as I made sense of my own career up to this point and what I want to do in the future was this particular quote um, that says, let us be those creative dissenters who will call our beloved nation to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion, to a more noble expression of humaneness. And if I were to kind of, you know, think about that point when my dad was giving the speech around that was anchored in Dr. King's speech and some of the work that my dad and my family members do and some of the work that, I, that I'm that i interested in, in studying, it's people who do this kind of work, people who are interested in you know, calling our beloved nation, our beloved communities, our beloved world to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion and to more noble expressions of humanity. So all of that being said, what I study overall, what I've been studying, what I'm committed to studying in the future is the micro foundations of inequity as Ariana pointed to in her introduction, which is just a wordy way of, of me saying that I'm interested in the small things, the everyday things that people engage in in the workplace and in organizations that either help make them become more equitable or help make them to continue to be more inequitable. All right, so language, interactions, relationships, those are the things that I'm really interested in. And honestly, you know, those are the things that really kind of keep my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very curious about them for my own self, but also for people who are doing the work kind of on the front lines on a day-to-day -day basis, like my dad, my brother, my sister, my sister-in-law. Like how do, how can they do it? How do they do it? I want to understand that and I want all of us to be able to understand that more clearly. I study this through a theory of stigma. That's one of the main theories that I use, as Ariana said. And as I've been studying this and using this theory over the past, you know, whatever amount of years has been, I, I've come to understand stigma or stigmatization as a process of meaning making about members who are considered to be substandard in society. And it's a process of meaning making about those folks worth, not only as workers, but as human beings. And through meaning making processes, so what that meaning making process is like everyday practices, like how we treat each other in interactions, like policies, practices, norms that we take for granted, um, their uh, substandardness becomes cemented. It's created, sustained, and perpetuated um, to relay the message to members that basically, you know, you do not matter. Um, so 
if so honestly if we were to summarize that you know stigmatization what it looks like in society is when people have to say actually we matter right when groups of people historically have had to kind of reinforce their mattering as human beings then there's probably some stigmatization that has happened and uh, we know that you know different. There are different types of stigma as it relates to disability, mental health, race, gender, social orientation, social class, religion. Right? There are many ways in which stigma manifests, and sometimes it's different, sometimes it's similar. And what I try to do is I study different kinds of stigmatized identities. Is say, okay, this is particular to this particular identity, but in what ways might it be transferable to other groups as well? Okay, so all of that to say that was hopefully to lead us into this conversation around allyship and advocacy because I study it under this theory of uh, of stigma, right? Of how do we move from people thinking that certain groups don't matter to them understanding that they matter inherently <laughs> inside of the workplace. So uh, I have in the past few, you know, five or six years started studying. Um, how people from non-stigmatized groups do the work of allyship or advocacy. That is not to say that people from stigmatized groups or from disadvantaged groups do not do this work. It is very important as well. But I became very curious and interested in how folks from the not like relatively non-stigmatized groups engage in these efforts. And so as a base, you know, how what is allyship? What is advocacy? And what comes to mind when you reflect on those words? I don't know about you, but so when I was creating these slides for this presentation and I put the words in, and you know how PowerPoint will kind of give you symbols? These are the symbols that came up. And I was like, that's so interesting that these are the symbols that came up for allyship and for advocacy. So I'll come back to that in a second, but allyship, uh, is basically often talked about, you know, as ways that folks from advantaged groups can support, ease tensions, uh, or ease relationships, reduce tensions between folks from disadvantaged groups and and um, and advantaged groups. So, how can thinking about how people kind of serve as that person that's supporting members of disadvantaged groups, but also easing tensions between disadvantaged groups and advantaged groups. So I think that that symbol is kind of interesting um, there, and I don't know quite how to what what to make of it, but I, I do think it's interesting. And the advocacy symbol, I think, so we might consider, so if, if allyship is, are these broad sets of actions and behaviors, advocacy might be one kind of, one set of actions, one set of behaviors that allies, people who are trying to be an ally uh, engage in or speaking out about a certain cause that's important as it pertains to a group that is historically uh, disadvantaged or, or, or you know, overlooked. And so I think that that, that's, that symbol speaks to what I would probably think of when I think of advocacy or allyship. I would think of like the big scene behaviors that people have engaged in. I would think of, which are important, right? I would think of people at the front lines and protests or speaking out you know, to a mass audience about something that is that is unjust, that is not right, and I think that those are all really important things that 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 happen as a part of making change in organizations and societies. And at the same time, there are also small behaviors that lead up to those bigger moments that I think came out in a recent um, that we were able to see in a recent study um, that was recently published. Um, in organization science. So uh, myself and Aparna Joshi and Glenn Kreiner uh, worked on this project that where we saw an, an emerging theme of what we term uh, bridge work, which is basically one perspective, I would say, I think we would all say one perspective on allyship and advocacy, which to me really speaks to the kind of more micro processes, the everyday things that may not be able to be tweeted talked about on social media, it may not make the news, it may not seem, it, it may seem a little bit more mundane, but they are actually profound when done on a consistent basis, is what I, one of the main practical takeaways that I take from the study, this study. So this basic, this, um, this paper is uh, actually one of the studies from my dissertation 
and it's qualitative in nature. So I interviewed uh, 75 people. There were 84 interviews, several site visits in different states of the country of the United States. Um, and I also participated uh, in the job coach training for 12 weeks. We also collected lots of supplementary data um, from um, different organizations that are part of the movement for. So this I should say this data was from job coaches who work with people with disabilities, particularly autism and related disabilities, and talk. they answer the question of how do you forge relationships between the non-stigmatized and the stigmatized, particularly those with autism and related disabilities and those that don't in the workplace. And um, so we talked to a lot of people who are part of the movement uh, for disability rights and uh, employment. Uh, and we uh, we observed and collected a lot of supplementary kind of archival data around what the, that history uh, entailed and what has been going on over time. And um, so I'll give, I wanted to share for the rest of the time that we're together some takeaways and then I'll pause and then whatever questions come up, I'm happy to answer them. And like I said, if you're a student at Tech, don't worry if you are interested in this. I would love to continue to engage in the conversation uh, in the class that I'm teaching next semester. One section is for undergrads and one is for MBA students. Um, and so while the research, and hopefully that's not too small for you, I hope it isn't. <laughs> Um, but I will read it out loud, and um, if we need these, I will send them to folks so that they can send them out to folks in the uh, listserv. Um, so while this research, as I said, this particular project is on job coaches who work with, work with folks with disabilities, so there are definitely some things that they did that were particular to, for folks with autism and related disabilities. Yet the takeaways that I'm sharing with you today, I think, are broad takeaways that people who want to engage in allyship and advocacy on an everyday basis for many types of groups can engage in. All right, so the first one here is that, uh, is understanding history. <laughs> so one thing that came out very strongly, almost everybody that I spoke to, uh, lots of the things that I read for this particular project started with the history. Why are these particular people, why, how have they been uh, undervalued or devalued? How have they been put into or made to believe as a part of a substandard group, right? That was often shared in my interviews when I started talking to people about why they do what they do. And then, like I said, it was often put in print in, in the documents by organizations doing this work. So for us, as folks who may want to engage in us on an, on an everyday basis, to me, that means understanding the history of whatever groups we're trying to be supportive of is really important. And committing to learning about the history over time, I think seems to be really, or I feel from this particular data feels very important. Second, building relationships beyond the task and the work and getting to know people as human beings was a very common theme, which is something that I think is something that we can start doing almost immediately, right? Um, not only talking about the work, but also talking about what are likes? What are dislikes? You know, like what strengths do you think that you have? What kind of history are you coming into the organization with? Not in such a way where you're forcing disclosure <laughs> of things that may be considered private, but in a way in which you're actually building a relationship that's that it, that is that is that is saying you are valuable beyond the work that you do. Um, next. Uh, something that came through very clearly, not only in what they were saying, but in our interviews, was that these were people, the job coaches that I spoke to, who practiced listening deeply and asking questions. Listening deeply and asking questions. And when I say listening deeply, it's, you know, there's a whole <laughs> body of work on what it means to, and how, on like how to listen. And we can begin to practice that, uh, you know, almost immediately. And listening is more than what we think of with we, what, what we do as an quote unquote ability with our ears. It's really like this next one about observing, sensing what is being communicated and what is not being communicated, right? In whatever fashion, body language, tone of voice, word, verbal words, written words, et cetera. The, the folks that were part of this particular study, we noticed that they did a lot of a lot of, of 
observing what was what was being done and what was not being done. They looked for other subtle but profound uh, methods of support for folks, and they they um, they also looked for ways in which policies, practices, norms may inadvertently disadvantage certain groups. They observed quite a bit. A lot of their work was observing. Again, not much that you can talk about or write home about, but that is what they did. And that was a key part of their job was making observations. Another one that is related to that is questioning assumptions. So once we observe, listen, make sense of what we're, you know, absorbing, we also are being this 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 work in everyday practice of this is also questioning the assumptions that kind of drive the, the, the norms of our organization, the everyday behavior in our organization that everybody considers to be normal, but actually may be uh, devaluing members of certain groups. Oftentimes they're so easy to overlook because they are best practices. They are the norm, right? And so what these folks said that they often did was they questioned assumptions about what was a norm and around what's possible, around what's possible. Does it always have to be like that? Are you sure, <laughs> right? And they tend to be guided towards organizations that would actually respond as, you know what, you're right. We can actually be more flexible in this area. Another one that is that I that it was a very profound theme was using language that was infused with dignity. So not only engaging in behaviors that show, you know, or building relationships that show, you know, you are worth more than your work. <laughs> you are a human being and you're worthy of being treated with respect was the ways in which they communicate, the ways in which they use language. One example of this from the data was in this particular movement for this particular because of the group's history, right? So going back to the first point the um, use of person first language was often very, very much so um, uh, encouraged. And <laughs> I heard this in interviews, we saw this in supplemental data and archives, right? Using person first language, which for this group that meant instead of saying a disabled person, saying a person with a disability. Right, so using the person first, and and it was it was mentioned in so many places. Now that might be different for different groups, right, based on their history, but it begs the question: How might I use language in a way that shows that I care and that this is a a worth a worthy human being that I'm that I that I'm speaking to? Um, the next one that I thought was a great everyday practice was being honest, right? We think being honest about strengths and rooms room for improvement not only for folks who have the stigmatized identity but also for folks who have the non-stigmatized identity i would i would probably say that this was often probably more commonly a strategy or a practice that was done for folks who are from the non-stigmatized group right a lot of times we think of the work of, we might think of the work of allyship as, you know, how do I make the person with the stigmatized identity fit into this organization? But what we saw happening was actually not that. What we saw happening was how can we help them see their strengths as they are without changing them too much? And then turning to the non-stigmatized, people from the non-stigmatized group and saying, okay, here is where you might want to uh, actually improve. You are you are actually lacking in these kinds of characteristics. You may not be a good fit for our person because you don't have these characteristics, right? And helping them to understand that, right? And so I think that's a an interesting practice that we can actually and being honest about that. Um, there are ways to communicate that that are not where you're not we're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but we do want to be transparent about what we are observing and why we want them to maybe consider making some changes. Okay, so the next one is try to be flexible with available resources. So while financial resources may not always be available to us to make the changes that we want, the big changes, at least right away, we can use resources like time, space, and material and get creative with them. And that's something that folks in the study did quite often. They, they use their time, they use the folks' time, they use space in ways in which to accommodate, to make accommodations, and to make changes. Next, uh, educate and show others how to do all of this, right? So that you aren't the only person doing this work in the organization from the non from the relatively non-stigmatized group. 
we want this not to just be one person, one person doing this role, but we want it to be something that can be modeled so that everybody starts to do it. And that's what we saw in our data is it became it became uh, something that happened around, uh, you know, throughout the organization. And the like the primary coach would 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 begin, you know, showing others. But before you knew it, more people, many people were engaging in these behaviors without being prompted. Next, which I think was, this was probably one of the most interesting themes to me in the day. And I talked to a partner in Glenn about this all the time. I was like, this is so fascinating. One of the key themes of our data was fading out. It was fading out. Knowing when to leave the relation, knowing when to step back from this role as ally or advocate, knowing when to step back from these, from, from being so involved. That was a key part of their process. And I think it's a key takeaway for many of us is not only knowing when to leave the relationship, knowing when to leave being that bridge worker, that person that's in between, but also knowing in the day to day, like knowing when to step in and say something and knowing when, you know what, that's not for me to say. And that takes a certain amount of discernment and intuition and practice, right? For us to, 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 to know when that is appropriate. Next, uh, bounce back and try again after mistakes. So the people that we talked to, they were off, sometimes they were successful in helping folks get jobs and keep jobs, and sometimes they weren't. And they knew how, they had a plan for how they were going to reroute, how they were going to get back in the game, if you will, after, if, if there was a, a placement that did not work, a strategy that did not work. And I think that as folks who are trying to do this on an everyday basis, that's important because this is, this is, is, it can be work where you don't always see the outcomes that you would hope for or that the person that you're trying to support hoped for. And so uh, making sure that you, uh, that you are encouraged to bounce back and try again after setbacks. And then last but not least, I guess it's kind of related to the first point, but I really want to drive it home is commit to learning and being a student and being taught uh, for the course of the role of you know being an allyship and advocate, which I think we can do on an everyday basis by you know using a good friend Google, <laughs> uh, books, audio audio books, attending seminars, classes, etc. So um, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I hope that this served you in some kind of capacity. And I, if there is, are there any questions or anything that I can do? Let me remember to unmute this time. <laughs> um, so such uh, just like powerful information. And I wanted to ask you, Tiffany, um, don't have any com uh, questions in the comments yet, but please, if you have a question, go ahead and drop it. Um, I feel like this takeaway list is almost like a roadmap for like if I am someone who is aspiring maybe to be an ally or looking to advance my allyship. Um, do you have any recommendations on sort of where where folks start or like like I said this list is almost like start with understanding some history and um, those kind of things and mm -hmm. and or do you have any um it, there's so many bullets here and we could spend hours <laughs> dissecting all of this but is any one of them do you have any recommendations or resources on any one mm -hmm. of them that you highly highly recommend or just like really stand out to you as something um you know, it's worth uh, sharing out with folks. Yeah, thank you for that um, question. I think that first one, the understanding history is probably a really great place to start because I think uh, it was such a profound theme in the data. And I think that can be related to any kind of advocacy or allyship work that we are trying to engage in. I was at this uh, that um, this session hosted by the Academy of Management, Dr. Stella Como recommended a book that I that I am so grateful for. It's called the 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 production of difference, and it's a really great like historical account of work and race relations in the United States. And I think that's a great example of what um, I, I I actually use it in my in my classes now, both organizational behavior and the class that I teach on work equity and wellness. So that might be like one example. But if if, if you're more interested in supporting folks from let's say folks with mental health challenges or folks with folks from the LGBTQIA wow. community, you might find other historical books or, or you know, references and, and, and models who can show and teach that history. 
Got you. Wonderful. Um, and we are right at 1230. So thank you so much, Tiffany, for sharing their research and your takeaways. And I'm going to like, wh where do I apply to audit the class? <laughs> 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 uh, for, for thank you so much to everyone for uh, joining us. And our next Scheller Lunchtime Live is Friday, January 13th, also at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will be featuring Pearl Alexander, Executive Director for Institute Diversity, Inclusion and Engagement and Professor of the Practice here at Scheller College. Pearl will discuss storytelling and inclusive excellence. She will share insights about how stories shape us and improve our social intelligence, leadership, and relational abilities. She will describe how she's led the integration of storytelling into diversity, equity, and inclusion as a transformative change strategy. You can register for this event and learn more about future Scheller Lunchtime Live sessions by following the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business here on LinkedIn. A recording of this session and future sessions will be available on our LinkedIn and YouTube pages as well. And thank you all for joining us.